Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on data management, best practices for producing high-quality data. My name is Katherine Tout. I am the co-director of Early Childhood Research at Child Trends, and we're just delighted for you all to be here today. Um, I'm co-hosting this webinar with Ivelisse Martinez Beck from the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. All of the work you'll hear about today and the work we'll briefly mention that has happened on two previous webinars is supported by the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. And Ivelisse will tell you a little bit more about Inquire, which is the group that has been supporting uh, the data work that you'll hear about today. So as I mentioned, we have three webinars. We've been doing three webinar series, and today is the third in that series. The first webinar that we did on it back in March, uh, March 20th, 2013, uh, was on overview and application of the Inquire data tools. All of the information that we have shared in these webinars is available at researchconnections.org. And the tools that we, dis that we d described in the first webinar uh, will be available very shortly, um, early this summer, so that you have access to them. But essentially, we began with a providing an overview of tools that have been developed to help states and researchers do their work, um, especially related to quality improvement initiatives and QRIS specifically. So in that set of data tools, you'll have access to a set of core data elements, a data dictionary, as well as a set of policy questions that and reporting questions that you can use to guide your work, um, and each of those questions is linked to the data element so that you can see how uh, all of those pieces link together to help you address the, the key questions that you have for your system. Our second webinar addressed the really important issue of data governance structures. So our webinar that was completed on May 6th dealt with the issues that need to be taken into account when we think about setting up a system that can support integrated data and that can support uh, bringing together the information that's needed to produce, uh, especially using the example of a quality rating improvement system, to produce a rating for programs. And so that webinar is also available or will be available very soon on Research Connections. And then today we're taking a third piece of this puzzle. Um, we're focusing in on best practices for producing high quality data. So our purpose for this webinar is to provide an overview of best practices in data management. These practices promote data integrity and ensure that high quality data are available for reporting, monitoring, and, and evaluation. So again, to put it in to the context of the other two webinars, this webinar will really help us learn more about the specific practices that can be used, again, using the lens of the quality rating and improvement system to produce high quality data. We know that aside from measurement issues and selection of quality standards, producing high quality data is really at the heart of a quality rating and improvement system. It's essential that data be of high quality, so that the ratings can be trusted and the system has integrity, both for those who are using it for accountability purposes as well as for the programs and providers who are participating in the system and trust that the data being produced about their program are accurate and are disseminated appropriately. So the two, our agenda for today is that we'll first, as I mentioned, Ivelisse Martinez-Beck will provide a little bit of background on Inquire and OPRE's support of Inquire. Next, we'll turn to the content of the webinar, which is really provided in three parts. The first is about specific best practices that support data quality in QRIS. And in our second webinar, you heard about some of the challenges that we have in QRIS data systems in particular. So we'll review some of those, but then talk about some of the best practices for supporting data quality. And then we have a second piece that's, that we know from states we've been hearing how important it is to think then not only about the elements of data that need to be collected, but how do you actually develop a data system that can support data quality, whether it's something that's developed within your state internally or whether you contract out or work with an existing data system. So we'll, we'll spend time talking about some of the some guidance and best practices on developing a QRIS data system. 
And then we're so fortunate today to have Georgia with us. They'll be providing a state perspective and really applying the different pieces that we're learning about today in this webinar, as well as the pieces that we've been talking about throughout the webinar series. So we're delighted that they're with us. And then we will end uh, with talking about some ne next steps and having some time for questions and discussion. So at this point, I will turn it over to Ivalice Martinez-Beck, who will talk a little bit about the Quality Initiatives Research and Evaluation Consortium. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm Ivalice Martinez-Beck, and I am the Child Care Research Team Leader at the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation in the Administration for Children and Families. Uh, we do research on the programs that are in, under the Administration for Children and Families, especially Head Start, Child Care, Subsidy System, Child Welfare, and other areas. The Quality Initiatives Research and Evaluation Consortium was funded by OPRE in response to a request from state administrators, evaluators, and researchers to have a place where uh, all these stakeholders related to initiatives to improve quality, such as the quality rating and improvement systems, could share lessons learned, could learn from each other, and where the group could develop resources that can help states and localities um, do a good job at implementing, designing, and evaluating uh, these systems. The consortium that was started about four years ago is primarily um, composed of researchers and evaluators who are working on projects related to QRS and other quality improvement initiatives or topics. But we, in many instances, involve the state administrators, policymakers, and others from the state to uh, have conversations with these groups so that we make sure that the work that we produce is relevant to the work that they're doing. Um, the purpose of INQUIRE, then, is to support high-quality policy-relevant research and evaluation and to provide guidance to policymakers on evaluation strategies, new research, interpretation of research results, and implications of new research for practice. If you want more information about INQUIRE and some of the other products that we have uh, funded through OPRE related to this topic of data and QIRS, uh, you can go to the OPRE website uh, listed in that slide and or you know, contact either Catherine or me, and our contact information is at the end of this uh, presentation. So like I said before, uh, we are responding m m mainly to what we are hearing from both OPRE funded projects and then other state evaluations and research that are conducted directly by state about the needs that they have for research-based information that will help them uh, organize and manage their data that they're collecting, the need to coordinate the efforts of the different departments and organizations that collect early care and education data, and the need for a better understanding of how to implement an effective early care education data system that is part of a larger early childhood data system. This is one of many, many topics that the INQUIRE membership address related to QIRS and quality improvement initiatives, and we'll be happy to share with you those resources um, if, if, if you want them. So I'm going to leave you now with Catherine and others and to hear our presentation. Thank you so much, Ivalice. So as I mentioned earlier, we'll be dividing the presentation into a couple of different sections. And for the first two sections on uh, best practices and producing high quality data and developing a QRIS data system that supports data quality, we'll be hearing first from Sarah Friese, who's a senior research analyst at Child Trends, and then also from Carlise King, who's the interim executive director of the Early Childhood Data Collaborative. And then, as I mentioned, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from Georgia uh, about their Bright from the Start, Georgia Depart from the Georgia Department of Early, Lear Early Care and Learning. And we'll hear from Laura Johns and maybe also from Bentley Ponder, um, who, is, who is sitting with Laura today as well. So um, we're so happy that they could join us, and they'll be on hand at the end also to answer any questions that we have. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Sarah Friese. Um, thank you, Catherine. So uh, 
in this section, I'm going to um, kind of talk to you a little bit about uh, best practices, like Catherine said. And um, this first slide really is a summary of some of the things that we talked about in our last webinar that related to data governance. So in that webinar, we kind of went through five of what we see as some of the biggest challenges um, to data governance in QRIS. And you can see those here. And um, the challenge number three is the one that's kind of going to be the focus for this webinar. So data practices often do not support the production of high quality data. Um, here we're really going to focus on that challenge and kind of expand um, out what we think um, are some solutions for addressing that challenge. And then this next slide um, kind of dovetails again with our previous webinar and just sort of a reminder of the importance that data governance plays in ensuring, ensuring data quality. So without a really strong data governance structure, it's hard to implement data quality procedures and practices that can be generalized across an entire, entire data system. So in this next slide, you can see that concerns about data, the management of data, really need to be a, taken into account during the entire life cycle of um, data collection. Um, which starts uh, in the planning phase and kind of goes all the way through through distribution. So if you're a state that can, is considering developing your own QRIS data system or contracting with a vendor to create one for you, a lot of the assurances um, of data integrity, integrity that you would want to have in place um, will be determined by the decisions that are made in that first planning phase in terms of how the data is structured, what's included, and how it's linked to other data sets. And so we'll be covering more about ensuring data quality when you're working with a team of develop developers a little bit later in this webinar. Um, and so you can get some more um, ideas of how you would uh, make those assur assurances for data quality when you're doing things like developing an RFP um, or once you have your system in place. So the second phase of the data life cycle that you can see here is collection, and that's really when individuals, whether they be from a state department of human services, say, or a provider or a pro someone working at a program, when they're really compiling information and entering it into some type of database. The third phase, phase is processing. That involves transforming the data, cleaning it, modifying it, making it so that it can be accessible for future use by a variety of stakeholders. Um, like I said, they, those stakeholders could be program staff at a Department of Human Services who need the information for program improvement purposes, or it could be an internal or external evaluator who really needs to assess the effectiveness or validity of the QRIS. The fourth stage is uh, data management, and this is really more of an extended and indefinite phase where data is housed in a secure environment, a lot of the data quality concerns at this stage involve, involve ensuring that the data remains confidential and that it's released to um, people who need to use the data um, on an as-needed basis following a standard set of rules regarding data sharing and that also that it remains uh, safely stored for long-term use. So the final phase that we have here in the life cycle is uh, distribution. And in this phase, data is sent back to practitioners, policymakers, researchers, and program staff staff, and sort of with their feedback, uh, the cycle typically starts again with new planning activities um, that are modified based on the feedback of the data users um, in terms of, and the, those modifications might include the data that's being collected or how it's being collected, and hopefully those modifications better reflect the work of the people that are using the data. So while we've illustrated um, this data uh, process as a life cycle, it's usually more of the case that many of these activities will be taking place simultaneously and that the concerns about data quality um, that you might have aren't really associated with one stage alone, even if they are more strongly connected um, with one stage more than another. So in the next series of slides, I'll kind of walk you through, through each uh, stage of the data life cycle and pr provide some best practices for ensuring data quality at that phase and then give you some um, kind of QRS specific examples of how those would look. So on this next slide, um, we've listed some of the data quality practices that are often associated with the planning phase of the data life, life cycle. So the planning phase is the most common point at which you'll uh, determine what you need to know and how you'll need to know it about, uh, and how you will need uh, to have that information structured. So some of the typical questions you might ask yourself uh, during this phase might be, you know, what is the universe of data elements that we need to collect? 
and um, are we collecting all the data elements that we need to validate our QRS? Um, how will we link the data we're collecting about practitioners and program to the programs they're working in? Um, what IDing system will we use for practitioners, programs, and children? So these are kind of some examples of more high-level, broader questions that you'll be thinking about during this stage. Um, but this is also a stage at which a lot of the real kind of nitty-gritty details um, about what is collected and how it's collected will be determined. So these details could include things like whether a certain data element is categorical or numeric or a date, um, the format of a date field, uh, the limit on the number of characters for someone who's entering um, something into a text field. So a lot of these decisions really um, span from those broad, higher level decisions down to these really specific decisions as well. And you'll see here that we use the example of how data from a workforce registry can be linked to data um, in a QRS to sort of illustrate one of our best practices. So sometimes registry data is embedded within a QRS data system, but it's often true that it's um, frequently on its own, in its own separate system, and the two separate systems need to be linked. So without that language, linkage, it becomes really difficult to understand the impact that training and education and practitioner knowledge, practitioner demographics have on quality ratings. So when you're designing your QRS system, um, data system, attention really needs to be paid to how that system will be linked to something like um, a data system that has registry and uh, registry data system. So will practitioner IDs from the registry be associated with programs um, and children in the QRIS? Will the ID of the practitioner be directly in the QRIS data system? Um, are the two systems housed in different departments or organizations? And is it necessary to establish a data sharing agreement that allows for merging of the data? Um, who will access the data sets with information from both the registry and the QRIS data system? These are some of the um, types of questions um, that it would be necessary to explore during the planning phase um, and make decisions on so that you know that you are structuring um, your QRIS data system in a way that is really conducive to the work that you're already doing or the data that's already being collected in other data systems. So on this next slide, um, we're in the next phase of the data lifecycle, which is data collection. And some of the best practices we suggest um, in this phase are using common, common data standards when available and using web-based electronic point of contact data collection strategies whenever possible. So the use of common data standards has really become commonplace and almost a necessity in the K-12 education world. But those practices have um, only more recently proliferated um, to the early childhood data community. And as you may know, and we covered this, like Catherine mentioned, in our first uh, webinar, Inquire's working on developing a set of common data elements for quality rating that would be uh, introduced early this summer. And these data elements um, not only cover quality rating, but a lot of other topics that are associated with that. And the plan is for these data elements to provide guidance to states on um, what elements they might want to consider collecting, how they would consider collecting it, and um, it will help hopefully promote uh, the sort of um, systemization and um, centraliz not centralization, but uh, systemization across states in terms of what they're collecting. So our next data collection uh, best practice is uh, for data to be collected in a web-based format electronically um, or shortly after the interaction where the data is being collected. Um, the example that we have for this is, like, let's say you have a cadre of observers who are completing an observation like the class or the ERSIN programs. Um, standard practice um, for a long period of time has really been to collect that information on paper and then enter it into a database at some later date. So best practice is really evolving um, to the point where the observer can and should, if, if at all possible, enter that data directly into a web-based data entry system um, as they are collecting at the program. And the reason that this is really a best practice is because it eliminates one additional opportunity to introduce error into the data entry. Um, an additional benefit of it is that also decreases the burden on the observer or any other staff um, responsible, for, responsible for data entry because the data doesn't really need to be col collected or entered twice. It doesn't need to be entered onto paper and then re-entered into the system a second time. So moving on to the next phase, which is data processing, you can see uh, the best practices that we suggest are to automate calculations, 
So an example of this might be um, automatic ratings that are gener gener generated using indicator level data um, in a QRIS data system. Minimizing the overwriting of historical data, so preserving all past ratings and all the information and data that was used to create that rating so that changes over time can be examined. Using basic quality control checks like double entry or tests of data entry quality and inputting data at the rawest level possible. And for that last best practice, inputting data at the rawest level, for QRIS, the best practice would be to enter data at the item level so that the data can be examined um, for any sort of patterns. So kind of building off our previous example um, that revolved around observation data, having observation data at the kind of finest grain pos level possible allows for determining whether well, something more specific than, say, an indicator or a domain, something like an item, uh, can be connected with quality. So in the next phase of the data lifecycle, data management, um, one of the best practices that we have here is to maintain really detailed, up-to-date code books about all the fields and data elements in your QRS data system. So I, I think that everyone sort of understands the importance of having really detailed quality system documentation. But what often happens is um, that activity kind of gets reprioritized once implementation activities are in full swing and are um, really uh, un taking a lot of people's time. But one of the main benefits of maintaining quality documentation is that it really provides a good historical timeline for changes to the system. So for example, if your state's QRIS was a point system up until 2010, but then switched to a hybrid point and block system late, um, that year, you would want to create a new data element to capture the quality ratings after that change. So the definitions and the notes from your code books would provide future users um, of the data with the context they would need to understand why there were two different data elements ex um, that existed to capture really the same type of information. So the last phase of the data lifecycle is data distribution. And this is really when information from the QIS is made available to different sets of stakeholders. So some of this data will be public, like maybe a program's overall rating, and some of it will remain private and will only be distributed um, to groups of people on an as-needed basis. So your site that displays public rating information should be well integrated with your QRIS data system such that changes to the ratings within the QRIS data system are automatically updated to the public site and that, that um, changes to data sort of seamlessly um, interact with each other. Um, for data that remains private, this is the stage where you want to ensure that data privacy and confidentiality concerns, um, like those that are related to HIPAA and FERPA, are taken into account. And it's, that's not to say that those concerns don't come into play at other phases, because they certainly do, but they're of special concern when you're making decisions related to the distribution of data. And for QIS, this is especially important, important as um, increasingly um, QRS is and um, are collecting confidential data about children and linking it to practitioners and programs. So in that case, it's really important to ensure that individual children are never able to be identified, whether that's by program staff who typically don't have access to identified data, but who might need to use a subset of the QRS data to do their work, or by um, an evaluation uh, in the context of reporting findings related to research about the QRIS. So uh, thinking about some of the best practices that we talked about today, we know that a lot of states have recently or will be developing QRIS data systems where they really need to apply these best practices. And this is true both for states that are working with in-house developers and for states that have chosen to work with an external vendor. So in this next se uh, section, uh, Carlise is going to talk about what you should be thinking about in terms of data quality when you're developing your QRS data system RFP, um, some guidance for working with the developers you select, and how to ensure data quality once uh, your system is up and running. Carlise? Thank you, Sarah. So as Sarah has provided an overview of the challenges and best practices for data management policies to support quality data, as she was mentioning, it's important that many of these components are addressed actually during the planning and development stage of your QIS data system. 
So whether you have an IT team that's in-house that you're working with, or if you're working with multiple developers, you want to have clear specifications that outline what you need your database to be able to do, what data you need in your database, what are going to be the sources of, those database, of that data, and then also how will that data be accessed and who should be able to access that data. So for this section, I'll be reviewing what system requirements to include in your RFP uh, with developers and vendors, and what questions you want to address as you're working with the developers that ensure data quality once your system is up and running. On the next slide, we've outlined four areas that it's important to think about prior to and then also to include in any RFP that you're doing for your QIS system or any data system that you're doing, uh, that you're developing. First, you want to make sure that your system is able, you want to think about what systems you want to be able to link with. And you want to have a process for what information you want to link with and then at what level. So for example, if you need the rating for your program for a program a child is receiving services in, you will need to set up this connection or process for connecting these records in your database. And when putting this into your RFP, it's helpful to let the developers know up front, even if you're not, you don't initially have the ability to link information, if in the future um, you want to be able to link certain information. It's helpful to have those conversations so that the way that the system is built out, that it allows you to address your current needs, but also the future needs of your database as you're updating and developing your system. The second is very important that you discuss a plan for the inclusion of customized fields. And this is something uh, important to include as you're working with a developer, particularly if you're purchasing a product that has already been developed, um, but that you know that you're going to need to customize for your own program needs. Um, having this conversation up front um, and laying out what your data needs are going to be is going to be helpful in making sure that the way the system is built out um, will address perhaps funding, specific way that you need data fields laid out for your funding streams or, or training that you're tracking for your system. Because a lot of what times what happens is that uh, agencies purchase a particular product and then they find that certain sections don't meet their needs and they end up trying to make changes after they've already um, purchased the system. And that may or may not work with other functions of the system. And these are things that you want to address early on in the process. The third is also to address verification processes needed for your QIS system, and then, as Sarah was saying before, how upgrades and changes to reporting requirements are going to be addressed over the life of the system. So you want to know, in, originally with the developer, if you need upgrades or changes, or for some reason a report, um, you have changes in your own program requirements, how will that be addressed as far as updating data elements and then also reporting for your system? And then last, but never least, uh, is including information about the security needs uh, and confidentiality requirements that are needed for your data. Uh, what's helpful in putting this in the RFP, it allows you not only to let the developers know what your specifications are for your data set, but it also allows you to know upfront what is the experience and expertise of that particular vendor in order to address those needs. The benefit of having these conversations early is that the developer is clear on what your needs are and they can provide their expertise in having as much information about what you need for your system. I think a lot of things that it's important to consider is that you are as much of an expert on your data as is the developer. So having those conversations around what your ultimate outputs are, needs are allows that developer to provide their expertise on what are potential ways to approach um, developing that system. On the next slide, once you have selected a developer, you want to work with them to understand 
what data you want to have in your system and what information will be accessed from other systems. So as Sarah was mentioning before, really establishing the universe of the data that will be collected. And as I mentioned in the RFP phase, thinking about and working with other stakeholders about what are your immediate needs and then also your future needs as well. So will you be including rate, only rating information in your system or will you also have information on workforce licensing or perhaps uh, the child care, child care subsidy information. In addition to outlining the data that you want in your system, you'll need to outline what information will also, how that information will need to enter that system. Uh, it may be that for some information, you'll want it to be updated by providers, but then, for example, you may want paper copies of transcript information that can be saved within the system. These processes and options are something that you're going to want to discuss with the developer before they move forward in developing your system. On the next slide, once you've established the relationship with the developer and what your needs are and what the universe of the data that you want to collect, when you're ready, you're going to want to work with your developer on the individual data elements that will make up your system. And so here's when you start outlining, once you have a clear idea of what you want to be able to link, what information you want to be able to access, what information is going to need to be updated from who, what those specific data elements are going to look like and how they're formatted. As you review these data elements, you're going to want to be thinking about who will be able to access that information at what level. Uh, for example, as Sarah was saying before, there may be child level information that should be only accessed at an aggregate level um, and never at a child level. Um, access to the data also includes thinking about the ability of staff to view, add, edit, or delete information from your system. And this goes a lot to your data quality when you want to think ahead about what is the functionality of the system for staff um, interacting with that system. Based on the information you have in your database and the processes of who enters and updates different data elements, you may need multiple levels of access for your database system. I cannot emphasize this enough as far as um, access to which components of the database, because uh, I've seen many times where someone comes in, they delete something that they didn't maybe necessarily know um, was being used for a particular report, and then that information is gone. And so it's really important in the development phase uh, and planning phase that all of these levels of access and security are established. And then on the last slide, in the end, uh, having established your process to check your data's validity and also outlining ongoing technical assistance to upgrade and adjust for changes that you may need uh, help with, will help you to continually improve and increase the, not only the functionality and the quality of your data, um, but also it will help you as far as the usability of your data. Um, again, it's important, as Sarah was pointing out before, of documenting all of these data needs and procedures that we've outlined. Uh, you want to make sure that the knowledge and the expertise for your database does not reside in one person and will not be lost if that person leaves. Uh, also, you want to make sure that there's an understanding of how the data elements connect to reporting so that there are not changes made to a data element that then disrupts other functions in the system. So as important it is in having that conversation with the developer in how you want the different information to link, what the inputs and outputs are, you also want to make sure to document all of this information um, because as I was saying before, if the people who have not developed the system are coming in later, you want it to be clear how all these connections are made so it doesn't provide, it doesn't threaten the quality of your data and the functionality of your system. And lastly, as Sarah mentioned, you want to plan for the life of your data. 
uh, and be aware of how changes and upgrades you make to your system may threaten the ability to pull historical data that may have not been documented in the same way. So as you're working to have ongoing technical assistance to make upgrades and improvements, you want to be mindful and relying on your documentation to understand how those changes may also impact your ability to pull and analyze historical data. And depending on the amount of data in your system, you'll want to also plan for archiving your data over time and assessing the capacity of your system to maintain historical data. Um, particularly since there's a cost associated with maintaining this information, you want to plan ahead for these needs. So I would like to hand over the presentation to Laura Johns, who will share with you how Georgia um, have developed procedures to support data quality in their quality rated system. Thank you. So, um, well, first of all, I'm the director of quality initiatives here at DECAL, and I oversee the quality rating and improvement system and work very closely with the internal IT department and our research team um, to make sure that we are collecting data and working with each data element that um, is housed here at the department so that we um, are not having any redundancy in data collection, but also are being able to collect um, really good data that our research team can use to help validate our quality rating and improvement system here in Georgia. So this next slide um, talks to you a little bit about the um, data planning process here um, at DECAL. Um, first of all, all of our data systems utilize the licensing system here at DECAL as our golden source of data. So um, every time we are pulling um, information together, we're looking at licensing numbers for particular programs as our golden source. And so data is always uh, updated within the licensing system first, and then that information transfers to other subsystems. So quality rated, in, which is our quality rating improvement system here in Georgia, is a subsystem of our licensing database. Just like our, um, our subsidy program has, is a subsystem, um, our Georgia's pre-K program is a subsystem, our professional development program is a subsystem. The licensing number that is the unique identifier then ties together all of these systems together so that we don't have any redundancy and the data is cleansed in one source so it doesn't have to be cleansed in, in the various other sources of data um, services. In Georgia, we utilize a web service to tie together um, our data from various systems. So where many states are considering trying to have one large system, we have found that the better way to handle that is to um, think about having a web service that will talk to each of our subsystems and collect the data as a better um, resource for us, um, specifically around quality rated and all of our other systems. Um, so we really do ensure that the quality rating improvement system here in Georgia aligns with the overall agency data strategy um, and the vision for our data. So we really do think of data um, as something that the whole department is going to use and that other agencies and stakeholders in the state are going to use to help us refine um, our system of care in the state of Georgia. We also really make sure that the data is easily available to the research team and outside researchers to support metrics and validation. Um, really all of the processes that we use for developing our quality rating improvement system was based on sound research um, about the quality and the needs of our state. So it was important that we develop a data system here um, through Quality Rated that would continue um, that historical way of making sure that our researchers who are in-house here at DECAL could analyze the data and slice it and dice it in multiple ways to look at validity and evaluation. Our next slide talks a little bit about um, the data collection methodology um, here at DECAL. As I talked again, the, the web services pull the data from um, multiple systems, which helps us uh, minimize um, multiple entry, which would um, really reduce data entry errors. We want to make sure that if a provider is typing in an application, that they don't miscode their licensing number, which would then um, give us bad data in the system. 
So it's important for us to make sure that we minimize data entry errors um, by pulling data from other systems and again, the, the major system being the licensing system. Um, the provider licensing data um, is pre-populated in our quality rating improvement application. So when a, a provider logs into quality rated to join our system, about 75% of their quality rated application is already populated with their licensing data. So if I was an applicant and I went in and logged in and I saw my application for quality rated, and I noticed that the director name was incorrect because that director moved on, I would be directed to an email link to my licensing consultant. She would then be able to go in and change that in the golden source data. And then the next time I log into my application, um, it would refresh to the new information. So that's really important to us. Um, we also um, gather automated compliance verification through the quality rated website. Um, that means that as someone is going through the quality rated process um, through their application and then actually through every phase, we are receiving updates from Georgia's pre-K program, from our licensing program, and from our child care subsidy program that that provider is still compliant with the rules and regulations and processes of each of those systems. At any time that they would go out of compliance, um, that would be flagged within our quality rated database because they would no longer be eligible to participate in that program. We're also very fortunate to have a very robust professional development registry here in Georgia. And our registry um, is supported by Georgia's Professional Standards Commission. The Professional Standards Commission here in Georgia um, verifies and validates everyone's um, licensure and educational status for teachers working in the public school system. And that same organization also um, verifies the credentials of our early learning and education professionals here in Georgia. All of that data in the Professional Development Registry that comes through the Professional Standards Commission is also pre-populated into our Quality Rating and Improvement System database so that a director or a teacher does not have to re-enter all of their data about their educational status, their tenure, um, their location of employment, their career level. That's all immediately pre-populated from this professional development registry. In Georgia, we have a relationship with RANA to support the collection of environment rating scales data um, in our program. We evaluate one-third of each of the age groups in every program that applies to be quality rated. And we send reliable assessors into the field with tablets to collect that data. That data is then evaluated and reviewed and approved and is uploaded into the BRANA system and then through a web service is called down into the quality rating and improvement system database. So not only can a provider see the scores um, that are being given to them for the environment rating scale, so can the TA consultants, the people at our help desk, the managers, and of course all the researchers on the research team. Finally, for data collection, we also collect all of the quality rated orientation and training schedules. So we have a training management system that allows people to register for training um, around quality rated. And as they register, we are getting information of the location they're registering in and the date that they registered. And finally, that they actually attended the um, actual training, um, which is something that we require for them as part of our quality rating and improvement system. So all of that, again, is um, called into the um, quality rated subsystem. On the next slide, um, I've just kind of highlighted how access is given to other entities. Um, quality rated in Georgia um, is supported by a group of six resource and referral agencies um, across our state. And they really are the, um, the tentacles of support to the field. Um, they have access to um, the quality rated database for program management purposes. So they can view the application. They can look at portfolio data that is submitted. They can look at um, the, the last time the center actually went into their portfolio and updated information. And they can verify affidavits. In Georgia, um, we require a save affidavit that um, verifies that a provider in the state who is going to receive public support and public funding um, is lawfully present in our state. 
Um, so that affidavit verification is actually verified and uploaded into the quality rated database so that a technical assistance provider would not go out and provide a service to a center that has not already been verified as lawfully present. The other agency that works very closely with us and um, is very involved in our database on a daily basis is Georgia Family Connection Partnership. The Georgia Family Connection Partnership is the nonprofit organization who manages Georgia's um, very robust incentive and bonus process. Um, as programs work through technical assistance and are rated, they receive a sizable bonus based on their ratings, between four and six thousand dollars. And that um, verification of the rating and the um, ordering of the um, bonus package and the shipping and unpacking is handled by this nonprofit agency who has received um, funding through our private partners um, who provide all the funding for that um, particular project. So they access our database to, number one, verify that a program is eligible to receive the bonus, to verify what level that program has received, which also tells them what type of bonus they will get. And they also manage and track everything from the ordering to the delivery to the um, inventorying of each of the bonus packages. The next slide talks about data processing for quality rated. Um, we're very, very fortunate um, in our department to have um, genius IT people who have developed an um, online portfolio scoring system that automatically scores our portfolios, which really eliminates in the scoring eras that could just happen from human beings um, literally just entering in an inaccurate keystroke. So that really accelerates our review process because as they're scoring different elements and verifying that 100% of the people have turned in a certain certificate, the system um, is actually scoring and giving them the level of scoring and then also uh, gives them the final score. We actually also have um, two CQI components for the quality rating and improvement system here in Georgia. CQI standing for continuous quality improvement pieces. Um, our nutrition component and physical activity component and our um, family engagement com component. The nutrition and physical activity section um, is an online survey that um, programs take through the quality rated database. They are scored through the database and then they are prompted to do an action plan um, which is also scored at the database level so that they can plan for improvement. All the portfolio documentation for Quality Rated is uploaded by the provider and is, um, is able for them to review it online and for our assessors, valid assessors, to review it online. Um, all the historical data is maintained and is accessible not only to the researchers, the technical assistance folks, the providers, um, but also to um, interested staff here at DECAL. Um, and every year, someone updates their portfolio so the old historical data is archived so that we can look back and see trends in, um, in scoring and trends in the type of material people are submitting to meet our criteria. Every transaction that happens through the quality rated process is logged and available for review. So I can li literally go in and watch all the emails and track those. I can track every time a person goes in and updates materials, updates documents in the system, that we're able to look at that and look at trends in, um, in those transactions. Portfolios um, cannot be submitted until all the standards are verified, and so that's a, a nice way that our system um, keeps the program from, from making a mistake and, and not submitting information that they already had. So they literally have to go through and, and check something saying, yes, I've submitted everything. Are you sure you've submitted it? It takes you back up to something that you haven't submitted. So there's really a lot of processes for making sure that providers get through the system in a way that they will be successful. Um, all scores are collected and available for validation purposes through the database um, and are reviewed um, by um, not only the anchors here in the state for both the portfolio and the um, environment rating scales, but also by our research team who looks at scores and um, for validity also. The next email, um, next email, sorry, the next slide shows the um, data management. 
um, we manage data um, through a scoring rubric. Um, and the scoring rubric um, is aligned to the, the protocols in which we have identified through a validation codebook um, that is currently um, under development for our validation process. And I think I'll um, let Bentley just kind of talk a little bit about our validation codebook and how we um, um, detail the scoring. And Laura, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and launch that um, link, the blue link, so that uh, Bentley can talk about that. Thank you. OK, thanks, Laura. Uh, we are just in the initial stages of doing the analysis on our validation process. So our code book isn't something that's readily available. Uh, what are what, The first step of this analysis is to look at our first 100 centers that have been rated and first 100 family homes that have been rated. And we're close to that. I mean, I think by the end of the month, we should have at least 100 centers. And probably in the first couple weeks of June, we'll have 100 family homes. So in doing that, we put together an analysis file that we're inputting the data as it becomes available. So we do have a code book that looks at you know, first of all, what each variable is labeled as, what's our value label for each of the variables, and then where do we get the source from that? Is the source something that uh, the research team assigns? Is it something that we compute through other forms of data? Or is it something that we're able to pull down from our various research sources? And then we also have a notes uh, column that if there's anything here that we're not sure if we can get, or something that we're not sure that's going to you know, be meaningful or that we're going to have to do additional analysis on, we're, go ahead, we're going ahead and making that notation. Uh, one of the things that we are lucky to do is what Laura talked about with continuous quality improvement. So with our nutrition standard, for example, providers get points by simply comp completing the self-assessment and then developing a TA plan from that. What we're able to do is our validation process, though, is we're able to go in and look at what those individual scores are on the self-assessment with the idea that maybe somewhere down the road we would be able to actually look at scores for getting points and not just whether or not the provider was able to, uh, to complete that. So the code book becomes really important there because we have to you know, specify how exactly we're getting those points. And sometimes it's not as easy from just pulling the rubrics up and looking at that. So that's where developing the code book has been uh, a really important piece. So, Laura? So, so we can um, move back to the slide. Um, so I think one thing that we have really found to be um, critical in our process is the idea that um, the research team um, and the IT team are involved in every decision around quality rated to make sure that we're aligning everything um, and aligning it with the bigger vision around data collection um, here at DECAL. So um, this slide just talks a little about data distribution. Um, we use email notifications that go to our providers to um, let them know that they've successfully registered, to let them know that their applications have been approved. Um, it would say we have notifications that talk about, I'm sorry, we had to return your application because there was a mistake um, in one of your demographic fields, to give them reminders that they haven't touched their portfolio in three months. Um, and to also give them um, information about um, successful submissions of their portfolio, what level um, they received for their um, quality rated designation, and reminds them of their annual renewal um, and the process for annual renewer, renewal. Our assessor team um, also receives email notifications to support their assignments for the environment rating scale. So within our database, um, our anchors actually go in and as a program submits a portfolio and is ready for an assignment for ERS, they can assign a lead assessor and it automatically generates emails to that assessor, which gives them really Im important information like the number of classrooms, the age groups, what tools need to be used, et cetera, so they can be um, fed through the process of getting those ERS assessments done quickly. Our TA providers receive email notifications each time a program request technical assistance, and it, those are routed based on geographic region. And Family Connections, our incentive partner, um, receives email notifications regarding incentive eligibility and leveling. 
our ratings are um, going public July 1st. We're very excited. And, and today I had the opportunity to preview the DECAL website search engine um, that parents um, will be able to see. So a parent will actually go into our website and they will say that they're looking for, let's say, family child care in um, one of our 159 counties. Let's say they choose Gwinnett. And maybe they would like to only look at quality rated providers. So select quality rated providers only, and they'll hit search, and every quality rated family child care provider in that county will appear. And it appears with the, the logo, the Q logo for quality rated. When they then click on to deeper information about that provider, they will get the information regarding the level that that provider was um, rated at. In Georgia, we made a conscious decision to first talk to parents that they want to choose a quality rated program and then to move into the level. So this first year, they'll be searching based on quality rated programs. And until they select that actual program, they won't have the information about what level. Um, that comes in another screen. So we're really excited to have that happen. Also, um, our tier reimbursement process also goes into effect July 1st. And we have an automated process linked to the subsidy system um, that also, um, through a web service, um, gives the tier reimbursement folks information about the level of a program so that they can um, add a bonus payment to their um, subsidy reimbursement. We also um, give data distribution regarding um, reporting. So all types of um, different reports that we have not only on our main page for all the employees of our department to a subsystem called Polar, where they can just get some basic information about um, quality rated at their desk, but also we have um, standard reports that um, are designed and um, any of the admin users can pull down reports um, not only about process, but about ratings and, um, and about demographic information from people participating in quality rated. The next slide um, is showing the, um, the, the uh, just a big pictorial of that system. So you can see the quality rated um, computer, and you could trace through and see how each of the subsystems either feeds into quality rated or where quality rated actually um, pushes information. So if you look at the quality rated um, computer, um, directly under it is this um, icon that shows our SHAPE Award, which is an award given by our Department of um, Public Health. And so Quality Rated will actually, through a web service, give um, the Department of Public Health information about the scores that a program has received, specifically in the nutrition and physical activity area. And those scores will be evaluated by Department of Public Health so that that program could receive an add-on certification from them. So this is just an overall screen about how each of the systems kind of pushes into quality rated or pulls information out. The next slide um, is just a quick overview of um, how the systems development at DECAL work. We're, we're very lucky here at DECAL in that we have an in-house um, information technology development team consisting of an applications development manager, four program developers, and one database administrator. Um, when we have vendor contractors um, and when we engage them as needed, um, they normally come in because they have a very specialized skill set, um, but we force um, that contract to be embedded within the agency. So typically, if we're going to bring in a vendor contractor, we're bringing them in literally to be physically here so they can engage in the culture and understand how the project they're working with is aligned with and connected to all the other subsystems um, at DECAL. We also embed in each of the agency divisions IT specialists that function as business analysts and information specialists. And um, those IT specialists are really the key to um, successful development. That next sl slide kind of describes what the IT specialist does. Um, they're a, a liaison between the agency division and the IT development staff. Um, and um, they really work with um, all of us to make sure that um, we are able to integrate all of our reports into um, other systems here at DECAL. Those IT specialists um, have backgrounds in need analysis, requirements and collection, um, and they, um, although they're not all PMP certified, 
um, they all follow um, systems development life cycle as defined by the Project Management Institute. This next slide just uh, talks about the fact that all of our IT specialists are IT people. So they are not program people. Um, um, it, it's very hard for a program person to um, turn into an IT person. But it, we have found it much easier for the IT specialists to really kind of um, take on the culture of the program that they're embedded in and to really learn that the, the business processes of that particular division. Um, and they have really been awesome at really understanding the business processes of the division they're working with and then helping us make decisions and um, guide us into methods of automation. They really help drive and force um, process improvement. This next slide looks at how we work with vendors. Um, uh, the decal project managers are assigned to all projects, whether the vendor provides a PM or not. So um, even if we're bringing in an outside vendor, um, we have our own internal project manager who's working with that vendor. So the vendor doesn't go off on a tangent um, and says, well, you know, it's easier for me to do it this way because this is what I already have. Um, we have a project manager who's making sure that they are responsive to the needs of the department. Um, the, program, the project managers support the successful delivery of the project. They ensure the accurate requirements are collected. And they're responsible for making sure that the project schedule and the budget are, um, are kept. They also ensure that all the deliverables are met by the vendor. So we never hire a vendor and kind of let them roam off on their own. They are carefully guided to make sure they're meeting the specific needs of DECAL. And this next slide underscores the importance that we felt was very important. And we would certainly recommend to all of our state colleagues that any product developed by um, an outside vendor becomes the product um, and the property of the agency, um, unless um, certain license propriety software excludes that. Um, we want to make sure that if that something happens with that vendor, um, maybe it's something that happens because there's a little personality um, situation between the client and the vendor, or maybe that vendor um, just moves out of that state. Regardless, that information, that product they've developed belongs to the agency, so we don't um, lose any continuity in the services we provide. Um, all the products developed by outside vendors are also meet the agency requirements regarding architecture. Um, and um, we use Microsoft products, so they need to use um, our development languages and the architecture of Microsoft. And whenever possible, we ask the vendors to work on site. Because the culture of DECAL, the culture of how our agency works, and the um, the relationship that each of our divisions have with each other is absolutely critical to making sure that the product that's being developed is meaningful for all of us to use and that we don't have um, systems out there that um, don't work for each specific division here at DECAL. So whenever possible, the delivered product is then hosted on the DECAL server. So these next slides, and I'll, I'm just going to check in um, with um, Sarah or with Carlise because I think we're going a little over time. So if you want to type in whether or not you want me to move fast or you want me to pause. These, um, these next slides really outline um, the inputs and outputs for our system. Um, this next slide looks at approval inputs and outputs, application inputs and outputs. So what that's really saying to you is that um, the child care licensing system, the, the golden source of data, is inputted into the quality rated um, database. Thank you, Sarah, for that message. So, um, so child care licensing inputs facility information, owner and corporation information, operating information, compliance information, if the program's a Head Start or early Head Start. All of that is received into quality rated application from our child care licensing database, which again is our golden source. Georgia Pre-K um, input into the quality rate application all the compliance data regarding the pre-K program at that um, location. Child care subsidy system um, inputs into quality rated compliance data. And our subsidy data system also um, gives information regarding compliance and takes out of our system rating information. So they pull through a web service um, rating data. Right now, our nutrition input is manual. So that's the one piece of the puzzle that we still need to work on. 
nutrition, um, which is housed here at the department, um, does not use license numbers um, as their um, ID identifier for each of their programs. So we're working on that, and I think we're about 75% through with making sure that we have the right license numbers with the right um, nutrition providers. Um, and then we would see that that program, again, would be um, an input into quality rated. This next graphic just gives you a nice graphic of how that looks. It shows the subsidy child care system, the pre-K system, and the child care licensing system all pushing in through a web service um, quality rated um, information into, the, um, into our application. The next slide shows portfolio input. So quality rated um, looks at structural quality through the, um, through the downloading or uploading of a child care program portfolio. The portfolio um, allows them to give us evidence that they meet criteria supporting quality rated. So right now, the portfolio inputs um, for quality rated are provided by the professional development registry, which inputs not only a provider, and a provider being an early care education professional, their PDR number, which stands for professional development registry, their status, the teacher's name, um, title, career level, their education, the number of training hours they um, have accumulated, and their start date of their program. So instead of a teacher having to resubmit this data for quality rated, it is an input from the professional development registry. And the next slide just shows a nice graphic of that. The next slide talks about external decal in, inputs and outputs. Um, our Child Care Resource and Referral Agency um, accesses quality rated to view applications and portfolio data to support technical assistance. They also can see the final Environment Rating Scales report, the full report with all the detail to support technical assistance. And again, I also talked about this earlier. They are able to see the affidavit verification. Um, the Brana system, as we talked about before, um, receives the information about each facility and the teacher data. So when an assessor goes out in the field and types in the license number of the program they're assessing, all the information is automatically fed into their um, laptop computer so they don't have to re-enter program data, teacher data, facility data, so we have everything, again, coming from that golden source. We've talked about family connections and how they use the data to support incentives. And right now, um, we utilize strengthening families to support our family engagement criteria. Um, and right now, users are directed actually to their website to complete a survey, and they upload that into Quality Rated. Um, we are hoping for the day when we can work with strengthening families to have a web service call um, their system to pull down the um, strengthening families data. I think that's really critical for all the states to really advocate for that so that we can gather data from the Strengthening Families Mosaic website. And I believe we've already talked about the SHAPE Award, um, our partnership with Department of Public Health to gather information regarding um, our standard two, which is our nutrition and physical activity standard. This next slide, again, just in a picture, shows um, how we are able to pull data um, through the web service or push data through the web service um, into different subsystems. The next slide just talks about communications again. Um, we've, I think we've covered everything on this slide, but we, we do a lot of communicating um, through inputs and outputs um, from the quality rated database so that um, things are automated and certainly saves time and manpower. And the next slide just shows again a, a graphic of um, the outputs for messaging around quality rated. So that's a whole lot of information <laughs> about the quality rated system. I know maybe some of the people on the phone have um, actually seen our database um, through another webinar, but um, I, I, I know that we'll have time for questions as people have them. So I'll, I'll turn it back to you, um, Carlise or Catherine. Thank you so much, Laura. This, I hope uh, for all of us on the line, it was so wonderful to be able to bring to life all of the best practices and the 
uh, guidelines that Sarah and Carlise covered at the beginning and to see how you've really brought them to life in your system and incorporated so many of the pieces that were mentioned in addition to many, many other issues that you raised, um, some of which were covered in our previous webinar on data governance. So thank you so much for that really rich presentation. And we absolutely will have time for questions. Um, we'll go to those in just a moment. But I did want to say that uh, for, in terms of next steps, as I mentioned earlier, all of the webinar recordings and the slides will be available on Research Connections. That's just researchconnections.org. And you can find Inquire specifically by scrolling down to the bottom of that Research Connections homepage. And there's uh, an entire page devoted to Inquire and the different products that Ivalice mentioned, as well as the, uh, the data tools that will be available shortly. And each of the presentations and uh, the issues that were raised on our, our second in the webinar today on data governance and on data best, best practices will be available in written form, um, hopefully early to mid-summer. So there will be some written documentation to help lay out some of these best practices that we've described and that you've been able to hear come to life through the wonderful state examples that we've had on, on each of the webinars. Just before we turn to the questions, I want to acknowledge on the next slide all of the contributors that have worked on the data work group from Inquire. There's a long list here, um, and they include both researchers as well as a state agency staff, and um, we have a number of federal, federal partners whom we're working with to make sure that some of the pieces that we're putting together, particularly with regard to the data elements and the data dictionary, that those are aligned with the critical reporting needs that states have, um, especially those through the uh, Office of Child Care and Office of Head Start. So you can see this a list of partners who've been participating in this work throughout, throughout the process. So we do have a few minutes now for questions. And, um, and I'd like to... Uh, and Laura, I hope it's okay if we if we dig into your system a little bit more with a with a couple of questions, wondering how you've dealt with it in your system. So we we had a question that came through about how do you now that you've got so much of your data that's entered entered into a directly into a web-based system, how do you conduct or review the documentation if you don't have a paper trail? So I think many of us still have this feeling that the paper trail, and Sarah mentioned this, that for so long it was felt that that was a really critical piece to have. Now that we've moved into web-based systems, what do we do without that paper trail, and how do we assure, ensure that we can go back and review and, and monitor some of the pieces that have been entered? So. Um, there actually is, is a great paper trail. It's just that the paper trail is in the form of PDF documents. So everything that is uploaded into the portfolio is available for review by the research team, by the assessors, and by the program that submitted the portfolio and their TA people. It's just that they click on the PDF document and open it up. They could print it. If the program wanted to have a hard copy of their portfolio, they could print it. We just choose not to print it and waste paper here at the department. Also, every time an assessor goes in and, um, and does literally the leveling of a program and rating of the program and assigning points, they're required through an online system to enter in their notes. So if I'm going to give you three out of five points, there's literally a little box there for me after I put in the score um, to say this, this program was missing six certificates for cultural competency and therefore did not receive the full um, score of points. So um, it's all of the data is right there. It's uploaded in the portfolio, or it's entered by the program director, or it's entered by an assessor, and it is all there. And then every year, their old information is archived, and their blank portfolio um, is turned over to them to resubmit their new information. So, um, so I think people should um, not be too worried about that, since in our system, everything is kept um, live time. Um, and, and if there are states that are, would like to see that, they could contact me, and I could literally give them a tour of what it looks like from the provider, and they could see how we, you know, archive the documents. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Do any of our other panelists, Carlise or Sarah, do you want to address that issue as well on um, the paper trail?
I would just say that I um, agree with what Laura had to say, that the paper trail doesn't necessarily have to literally be on paper, but hopefully if you're um, you know, putting in place some of these best practices and you have this, you're saving all of the historical data, you will be able to go back in whatever format it's in and sort of retrace your step, steps or recreate data and pull on any historical data or historical information that you need um, to understand how you got to the current place that you're at. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is Carly, I, I, I agree. It's similar in working with your developer and making sure that you have multiple backups of your information um, and that, that you have that information stored. Um, I know for some agencies, not just on-site, but also off-site as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm just uh, looking at some further follow-up on the question. And I think um, this may be also a question our, our questioner was asking about more broadly for when you don't have access, for example, to a PDF. And so I'm thinking one application of this may be when you're conducting um, an observational assessment, for example, where you're the, the only time you'll be on site in that program is that that's the moment you'll be entering the data and you would not be able to go back to a paper copy. Does, does that change the answer for any of you, or do you have further thoughts on on that piece? Well, this is Laura. I, I, I kind of heard two different questions in there. So the, the first question is <laughs> environment rating score with scales, which is our only on-site um, observation, three hours per classroom. Um, that information is immediately captured in a tablet, and our assessors are required to give detailed information as to what they saw. Um, and so that information is captured and uploaded um, into our system so that we have it um, and they literally have the date and the location of where they are and upload it. But the other piece of that that I thought I was hearing in that question was, what if a program um, is struggling with how do I upload a PDF into your system? And our system guides them through the process of saving documents as PDFs and uploading them to us. The program probably has the document in Word and PDF, but all of our documents are uploaded as PDF, and that's um, to protect our system from viruses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's really helpful. And in, in general, it raises another question about, um, it, I think it's an implementation issue, and it cuts across so many different levels. Uh, you just mentioned this really important level of how do you implement at the level of a program where they need to decide about which documents to submit to you, but also these critical pieces of how do they PDF, how do they get it to you in the right format. So there's training and support that needs to happen on that level. Then, of course, the training that we need to have for observers in the field and those uh, that you mentioned, those who are writing notes to say, this is why I gave that program three points instead of six points. So there's training there, but there's also just this critical training about how do you use the data system, when, do you, when are you required to enter your data after what amount of time, uh, what, what supports you have available. I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about that really critical training and implementation support for using a system that it, it ultimately in, is ensuring data quality, but we also have these, the, the user issue and how we make sure they're using it in the way you intended. So um, not only do the providers in our state have a technical assistance person assigned to them who can go out on site and, and work with them to understand which is the appropriate data that should be uploaded, but how do you literally save it to your desktop and upload it. Um, we also have a full-time help desk um, staff member, so a program can call into us and talk through, you know, I know you want proof that my families are getting information about immunizations, but how do I prove that to you? So we have someone who can say, well, have you ever sent a letter out, or do you have a newsletter that talks about it? Um, that would be the kind of thing, and then she could also talk them through how to upload it. We also have very good instructions on the online system that direct people to the exact type of data that we would like to collect um, and guide them through uploading that data. So, um, so I would say really um, having knowledgeable technical assistance staff that we actually train um, from our own department so that they are able to support the staff is, is really, really critical. But the other piece of that for us was how do you support a family child care provider 
who may not even have access to the technology. And our technical assistance um, coaches sometimes have to go out with their laptop and their scanner and support a family child provider in the field to manage this data system. Um, and so I don't want to make it sound like it's always really easy and everybody can do it easily. Um, we've had two or three folks um, out of the thousand that we're supporting right now who literally needed someone to hold their hand and walk them through the process. Um, another big piece of that is we have provided cohort support to our, our largest providers in the state. So large providers like um, Learning Care Group and Child Care Network and the Sunshine House where there's a decal staff member assigned to their corporate office to support them in making sure that they don't have redundancy in submissions. Um, if all the Sunshine Houses use one curriculum, then we guide them on how they can submit the one curriculum for all their programs. So there's also managing that larger subsystem of users so that um, a whole system of care, like a corporate system, can know what type of data to submit and how to submit it and can be supportive to then their end users, each individual site. Great. Uh, another question about, um, and this may be, I'm not sure if Bentley is still there, but maybe a Bentley question, Laura. Um, I'm wondering about how you've been using the data from your system so far. Bentley had talked about a validation process for looking at some of the data. Can, can you give a little more detail about what information you've been looking at in your system and whether you've run into any concerns or issues that you think might be good to pass along, you know, some, some do's or don'ts, lessons learned um, as, you've, as you've now using it, not the, using the information, not for the rating, but for the, the research component and looking at how well your system or the rating process is working. Sure. So um, actually, of course, as soon as you had said that, Bentley had walked out, but I can certainly talk <laughs> I'm a little sorry, bit. sorry, Laura. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> so, um, so we are in the middle of a pretty robust um, validation process. And, and, and we are absolutely looking at and have identified some things that we would think about doing differently. Um, the validation process is looking at inter-rater reliability um, around our portfolio and the environment rating scales assessors. It's looking at the distribution of program standards and criteria um, and whether certain program standards are rating high or certain ones are rating low. And, and can you look at that based on the type of program? Um, we're looking at um, elements um, collected through the portfolio and the accuracy of portfolio um, submissions. Um, and we're also verifying um, when someone submits something in a portfolio, our assessors are, are given a random checklist of things that they will verify from that portfolio. So for example, if I submit that I have this amazing parent resource area with all these parent resources, in my portfolio. When the assessor goes out to do the environment rating skills review, she'll have received a randomized checklist and she'll have four things that she needs to look at. And if she doesn't see the parent um, resource area, she makes note of that um, and turns it back in so we can also kind of look at portfolio accuracy. We're looking at the distribution of rating levels right now. Um, the, the, the metrics of 100 family child care providers and 100 centers was really important for us to get to because although our family, our child care learning centers are producing a nice bell curve regarding ratings, our family child care providers are actually rating pretty equally at the one and two star level, which kind of makes you go, hmm, maybe we don't have those cutoff scores accurately set. So that's something that we're looking at uh, is the differentiation in cutoff scores for family child care providers and child care learning centers. Um, so those are all some of the things that we're looking at. We're also looking at um, whether or not um, retention of staff is affecting scores um, for programs going through the second time. Um, so you know, just a, a whole lot of things that we're looking at. Some of the validation challenges for us are making sure that we're reporting mutually exclusive data. At first, we were reporting um, redundancy numbers of the number of programs that have applied, the number of programs who have submitted a portfolio, the number of programs who have been rated. And then we realized, oh, we've counted people twice here. So now we've you know, looked at that and have developed a mutual exclusive data set. Um, so there are some things that we recognize that we were reporting 
in a haphazard way. Head Start data is um, where we, we really struggle with um, locating the contractors at their physical addresses <laughs> because the contractee could have multiple sites or multiple classrooms at different addresses. And so we were, didn't have that data set totally under control um, regarding early Head Start classrooms and um, Head Start classrooms. So those are some of our challenges that we're seeing as we are beginning our validation process. Thank you. That's really helpful. And I'd like to just ask one final question, and this is about uh, technical assistance data. We've we've talked quite a bit a lot. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about the rating data and the data that you gather from programs. But I'm wondering if you can talk about what and, and briefly what fields uh, are your technical assistance providers entering into the into the database, uh, and and whether you've had any concerns about data quality or have made any you know, special provisions on, on the technical assistance side that you think would be helpful for other states to hear about? Sure. So right now, the technical assistance providers do not enter into our registry, into our database. They um, have their own system to monitor their technical assistance. Um, Craig um, and his team are working on a new system called Georgia Trains that will allow technical assistance providers to um, enter into our database information regarding dosage, type of support, um, who the support was provided to, um, and that um, system is probably about um, 24 months out for being ready. Um, and then once we have that system and everybody trained to use it, then that system will also um, be captured in quality rated. And then we will be able to start attaching the idea of how much technical support is needed to get a program through the rating process. Thank you. Thank you. I know that uh, from other work that we've done, the, the area of data support for technical assistance providers is one where uh, we really we need some more support in many states where the, the technical assistance providers are, in some cases, not entering data on a regular basis, um, waiting until they've completed their work with the provider and keeping a lot of paper records. Um, and I think this is really one area where um, it will be helpful for states if you have developed training modules or supports for technical assistance providers, it would be wonderful to start sharing those so that we can learn from each other what's working well with that particular group. Are there any uh, final comments that uh, our presenters would like to make as we wrap up, Carlise or Sarah? Okay, well that's that's fine. I, I will I'll wrap up on our behalf. Um, I just want to thank Laura again, you and Bentley and Craig for a really uh, a rich presentation full of so many examples and so much for us to think about as it relates to the best practices for data collection that we um, covered in the beginning. And I guess on behalf of uh, of OPRE and um, inquire. Just thank you all so much for participating in this webinar series. And we look forward to sharing the materials with you and um, working together over the next year or so to, um, to really put high quality data systems in place that can support our quality rating improvement systems and the many other early childhood initiatives that you're all working on. So we appreciate your participation and look forward to working together in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ivelisse, did you want to say something? I'm sorry to cut us off early. No, that is fine. Thank you to everybody. You did a great job. Thank you.